give the word, the floor to Dr. Eve Overgau from the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin. Uh, I don't have a title, but this is not necessary. It will, uh, yes, you have one, and uh, um, it is the first uh, speech in our workshop outside the introductory paper, and it will be very important. And it is to the section, the manuscript as cultural object description. Thank you very much. Within the framework announced by Professor Leonardi, I will um, speak to you in my quality of manuscript librarian and a paleographer. The title is Catalogues of Manuscripts in the Digital Age. The systematic cataloguing of collections of medieval manuscripts in European libraries started in the 18th century, here in Florence. In 1774 to 1777, Angelo Maria Bandini published this huge five volume catalogue of the Latin manuscripts in the Biblioteca Medicia Laurentiana as a printed book. His catalogues were the result of hard work and profound learning and have only partly been substituted by more recent or even modern catalogues. Before Bandini, several librarians in Germany, Austria, Italy, and elsewhere published printed lists, inventories, and other sorts of catalogues of their medieval and modern manuscripts, but I am inclined, with many other paleographers, to consider Bandini as the first scholar to publish a modern catalogue of manuscripts. In the 19th century, the cataloguing of medieval manuscripts was considered, at least in a few European countries, as a national mission to be promoted organized and sponsored by the national government. In France and Italy, national cataloging projects were started, resulting in the wonderful Catalogue Générale des Manuscrits des Bibliothèques Publiques de France and in Mazzatinti's Inventari des Manuscriti delle Biblioteche d'Italia. Both series consist of more than 100 volumes and are still being carried forward. All paleographers know the wonderful series of catalogues of medieval and modern manuscripts in the British Library, published from the early 19th century onwards. In Germany, the National Manuscript Cataloging Project was started in the 1930s, but this project was interrupted, for obvious reasons, at the beginning of the Second World War. Only a few volumes have been published. The systematic cataloging of medieval manuscripts in Germany was started again in the late 1950s, now with much more success. From 1959 until today, more than 100 volumes of catalogues of manuscripts in public libraries in Germany have been published, most of them thanks to the continuing support of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, DFG. These catalogues have found recognition far beyond the German borders. During the 20th century, there have been several debates and a fair number of important publications about how to make a good description of medieval manuscripts and about how to set up a catalogue of this particular kind of manuscripts and about how to make indices and about what we call today collection level descriptions. These debates were really important in their days and haven't lost their interest for manuscript cataloguing today. They not only deal with the material aspects of manuscripts to be described, with what we call now codicology, but also with the way in which these aspects are to be described, about the vocabulary and about the technical terminology to be used by the scholars writing catalogues. The scholars participating in these debates try to find out which elements of manuscripts were relevant to philologists, historians, historians of theology, philosophy, law, sciences, and to other academic subjects. They sometimes reached a consensus, but the academic debate on these themes never finished. 
the various rules, guidelines and instructions published in, the various, in various countries proved to be very useful, even when they were followed by only a minor number of catalographers. Some major libraries, such as the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, made its own guidelines, whereas those published by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft in Germany are mandatory regulations for all libraries in Germany who would want to apply for funding for making a catalogue of medieval manuscripts. The guidelines used in Austria, in Switzerland and in Sweden refer, openly or silently, to the guidelines of the German Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. These German guidelines require three sections in the description of any medieval manuscript. One section describing material aspects containing information about paper, watermarks, watermarks, sizes and formats, quires, scripts, bindings, miniatures and all elements, other elements of book illumination. The second section of a description deals with the history of the manuscript. It contains motivated notes on the dating and localization of the manuscript, referring to colophons, scripts and scribes, as well as to, as to dated and datable texts. The dating and localization proposed by the catalographer require explanatory statements. The second section on the history of the manuscript also contains notes about the identity of scribes, illuminators, bookbinders, and other men and women who contributed to the production of the manuscript, but to former owners, private and institutional, as well ex libris and other ownership marks, to old shelf marks, notes on sales, etc. as well. The third section of a description deals with the contents, with the text contained in the manuscript. All texts are to be identified, referring to editions, reference works and, if necessary or useful, to other manuscripts containing the same text. Even if other guidelines differ substantially from those issued by Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft in Germany, these three sections appear with different emphasis and with various vocabularies in practically all modern descriptions of, modern, of medieval manuscripts. Some catalogues, modern catalogues, pay more attention to texts, others deal extensively with book illumination, others, especially in Germany, deal with many material, codicological and historical aspects, but seen from a certain distance, <coughs> catalographers agree on, let's say, 80% of the aspects to be considered in a good and full-fledged description of a medieval manuscript. There is no serious doubt among scholars dealing with medieval subjects about the usefulness of catalogues of medieval manuscripts. These catalogues are indispensable for all sorts of research dealing with medieval history in the broadest sense of the word. I guess there are between 600,000 and 750,000 manuscripts in public libraries all over the world, 90% of which are kept in Spain, Italy, France, German, German, Germany, in the Vatican, and in the United Kingdom. I would guess that descriptions of half of them are available in printed catalogues, as well as in unpublished censuses and in inventories and in web publications. Less than 10% of all medieval manuscripts in Latin script are still kept in the places where they were written, read and kept until the year 1500. More than 90% was dispersed over hundreds of modern libraries, public and private, mainly in Europe, but also in the United States and on other continents. This dispersal started in the Middle Ages and continues in our days. As a result of systematic cataloguing, tens of thousands of manuscripts have been attributed to their scribes, scriptoria, and medieval owners. In this way, the cataloguing of manuscripts contributed to retract the dispersal of these manuscripts and medieval collections. 
at least virtually, within the covers of the body of catalogues of manuscripts, as well as in a great number of monographs, medieval libraries have been reconstructed. All the same, at the same time, the number of printed and handwritten catalogues has become so great, there must be several thousand volumes of this kind, that no scholar is able to oversee them all. Some distinguished scholars started to publish extremely useful bibliographies of manuscript catalogues. All scholars dealing with manuscripts know Christopher's Latin manuscript books before 1600, a list of the printed catalogues and unpublished inventories of extant collections, continued by Sigrid Kramer and other German bibliographers. In the digital age, in our age, it has become obvious that this kind of bibliographies can best be published digitally and be made available on the web. At the same time, already in the 1980s, the idea has emerged that descriptions of manuscripts should no longer be published in printed catalogues, but in databases. The first initiatives to use computers for cataloguing manuscripts started some 30 years ago in France and in the Netherlands. From our actual point of view, these initiatives seem extremely primitive, but we should not forget that memory cap capacities of computers and the human sciences were extremely limited until about 20 years ago. Databases were available, but not with the same possibilities as today, and there were no authority files. During the last 15 years, several European and American institutions, institutions developed sophisticated databases for collecting and filing data on medieval manuscripts. Some of these databases contain data on the manuscripts in one particular library, such as the Austrian National Library, the Vatican Library, or the British Library. Other databases deal with manuscripts in public libraries and archives within a particular geographic area, such as Manuscripta Medievale in Germany, e codice in Switzerland, Manus in Italy, and Digital Scriptorium in the United States. A part of these, there is a great number of databases containing information on manuscripts, containing the works of a particular author, or containing texts in one or another of the traditional academic subjects, or on manuscripts written in this or that medieval script. <coughs> the extreme diversity of information available in the web is reflected in the diversity of information available on medieval manuscripts. Modern databases on medieval manuscripts have some common features, features such as the possibility to enter new data according to a given scheme, either by using a template or a client. Some databases use thesauruses, authority files or other reference files. Some do not. Some databases, such as Manuscripta Medievalia, are closely connected to the national guidelines for cataloguing medieval manuscripts. In Germany, you already mentioned guidelines of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Some databases, such as e codices in Switzerland and Manus in Italy, are born digital, although they also contain data, either copied, sorry, although, although they also contain data copied either manually or electronically for printed or handwritten descriptions of manuscripts. Manuscripta Medievalia, probably the world's major database on medieval manuscripts, originally contained the index entries of more than 100 printed manuscripts catalogues. These index entries refer to the shelf marks of descriptions of manuscripts in printed catalogues. These index entries were copied by hand into a small database in the 1990s, first published on microfiche, 
later on made available in a major web-based database, together with the digital copies of the printed catalogues to which the index entries refer. Cataloguing of medieval manuscripts in a database is, like so many other operations in everyday life, easy on the one hand and complicated on the other hand. It is easy as long as the number of elements of each manuscript to be entered into the database is limited and as long as the structure of the template or the client is easy to handle. As soon as the number of fields in which data are to be inserted rises and as soon as the structure of the database requires a hierarchical order of the data to be entered, things are getting much more complicated. As long as the catalogue entries are restricted to formal aspects, to aspects you can count and measure, such as the size and the number of pages, the number of lines, or the year in which the manuscript has been written, making a digital catalogue is rather easy. But as soon as the texts to be inserted in this or that field of a web form are more complicated, or rather more structured, or in more, than in, or, pardon, or in more than one language, for instance Latin and German, or Latin and Italian, things are getting much more complicated as soon as you consider, in the back of your head, the possibilities for research and retrieval. Databases normally require standards, standard forms for names of corporate bodies, places, monasteries, monastic orders, and, most of all, persons. Persons to be identified in medieval manuscripts are authors, scribes, former owners, illuminators, bookbinders, and many others. Within the book covers of a printed catalogue, you can normalize the personal names you deal with according to the language in which you write, in the indices as well. If an author is named Bernardus Clarevalensis in Latin in a manuscript, you can call him Bernard de Clairvaux in French in the indices, or even Bernard of Clairvaux in English, or Bernard von Clairvaux in German. The readers of your catalogue will certainly find their way to that famous Cistercian monk and prolific author. But it doesn't work this way in a database. A good database needs a standard vocabulary, requires authority files and thesauruses. This seems trivial for the names of persons and places, but it isn't. A well-read colleague of mine found 27 different names for the Cistercian called, in English, Bernard of Clairvaux. The national libraries in several countries developed, in the last 20 years, authority files for antique, medieval and early modern authors and other persons. These authority files can be used for cataloguing manuscripts as well as an, as an aid for research and retrieval in an existing database. These authority files usually contain several or even many forms of the names given to a certain author, but not 27 variations of the name of Bernard of Clairvaux. And not even the best authority file contains the names of the medieval scribes, bookbinders, booksellers, book collectors and illuminators we meet with in our manuscripts. In other words, Authority files for names of persons are useful. We need them, but they only partially respond to our requirements. The situation is slightly better for, let's say, geographical names. There are very good authority files for modern actual names of places in Italy or Germany, but also in Nepal or South Korea, but not for the names of places that no longer exist in Germany or France or in Italy, or for historical Latin toponyms. There exist authority files for persons, for modern and historical entities, 
and for geographical names. These authority files are, as I said, not always satisfying, not to say that they are dramatically imperfect, but they can be used and they should be used. They should, moreover, be improved. There are, however, no authority files for many other frequently used elements of descriptions of medieval manuscripts. There are no authority files, for instance, for the titles of medieval authors, for the works of medieval authors. The titles of the huge but manageable corpus of classical Latin literature are available. Classical philologists have reached an agreement on the names of their authors and on the titles of their works. Such agreements do not exist for the titles of medieval works, not even for the titles of the works of the major theological authors of the High and Later Middle Ages. Whereas the corpus of patristic literature written before the year 700 is summarized in the invaluable Clavis Patrum Latinorum, no such reference works exist for the enormous number of high and late medieval theological texts. Stegmuller's Repertorium Biblico Mediaevi is very useful as a reference work on medieval commentaries of the Bible, and so is the handbook of the same learned author on the medieval commentaries on the Sententiae of Peter de Lambert. These two works, together with other authoritative repertories on different categories of medieval literature, taken as a whole, as a corpus, make up a huge printed authority file. All these repertories, existing repertories, could be converted to a real electronic authority file, but it would take several years and a substantial amount of intellectual endeavor to realize this. Who is going to do this? Who is going to pay for it? Who will pay an indemnity to the holders of the author's rights to these repertories? There are, as I said, many elements of medieval manuscripts for which there exists no standard vocabulary at all. We all know Denis Musarel's Vocabulaire Codicologique and its Italian and Spanish translations. These vocabularies are available on the web and they are very useful. An English translation of Musarel's vocabulary, vocabulary is on its way, but the German translation is still wanting. There are, moreover, several reference works proposing a comprehensive vocabulary in this or that particular field, for bookbinding, for instance, or for illumination. But such, such vocabularies do not exist for medieval scripts, and all paleographers know why this is the case. Whereas paleographers and codicologists do agree about words for many parts of medieval books, they have reached no mutual consent about the names of medieval scripts. They are aware of the enormous variety of late medieval scripts in all parts of Europe. <coughs> they tried to identify parameters for distinguishing these scripts from each other, but they recur to abstract provisional terms for naming these scripts. It is but a meagre consolation that the contemporary, I mean the medieval and early modern names for scripts, are heterogeneous and inconsistent as well. Applying this situation on the theme of our conference, I conclude that we are far away from establishing an authority file for the names of medieval scripts. As I said before, the existing databases containing descriptions of medieval manuscripts are very different among each other. They not only have different kinds of contents, they have different purposes and ambitions as well. From a technical point of view, they are hardly compatible, as the platforms and the software are substantially different. It is, therefore, not easy 
to make them communi communicate with each other. On the basis of common contents, CEL, that is the consortium of European research libraries, uniting a couple of dozens of major, major scientific libraries in various European countries, developed, CEL, developed a search engine for the CEL portal, allowing a simultaneous search in about 15 databases containing data on medieval manuscripts. The CERL portal provides access to these distributed databases containing manuscripts. Databases that are included can be harvested. That means that the records have been collected from its original databases and stored in an integrated local index. The records are, alternatively, accessed on the fly. The records are then collected through a live connection. The CERL portal allows a good first access to the connected databases. But, because of the differences in the data structures of these databases, and because of the diversity of languages, the results of a search are not always satisfying. If you would prefer the same search in each of the individual databases connected to the CERL portal, the number of hits would be substantially higher. A search through the CERL portal is, consequently, useful as first orientation on any specific, well-defined topic, author, title or place. Now, what do these observations have to do with the theme of our conference. What is the relevance of interoperability in this particular matter? Interoperability is, according to Wikipedia, a property to the ability of diverse systems and organizations to work together. In the context of this conference, this definition does not refer to the ways in which I cooperate with my colleagues and staff members, but to the way in which databases on medieval manuscripts can cooperate, work together, or rather communicate. And if passive systems themselves cannot work together, or rather communicate, sorry, and if passive systems cannot work together, this has to do with communication. How can two or three or ten databases made to communicate? One way is a simultaneous search such as offered by the CERL portal. This search, as I demonstrated, is very useful for a first orientation but offers a limited number of results due to the lack of common authority files, to the use of different languages and due to the lack of a common scientific vocabulary as well, even within the limited fields of paleography, codicology and book illumination. Now, what has to be done to promote interoperability between databases on medieval manuscripts? First of all, each database should aspire towards homogeneity in its own use of names and of persons and places of titles of works, technical and other terms. Those databases which, like Manuscripta Medievalia, copied their contents mainly out of printed catalogues, do not offer homogeneous contents. At least the names of persons, works and titles should be normalized. But this requires enormous amounts of time and a considerable intellectual input. If two names of persons appear to refer to the same historical person, one of these names should be modified into the other name. If, with the help of good authority files on the names of persons, 27 versions of the name of Bernard of Clairvaux can be made to refer to the same person, we have reached our goal until we meet with the 28th variant of the same name. 
This 28th variant should either be added to the file on Bernard of Clairvaux, to the authority file record on Bernard of Clairvaux, or be normalized. Serious, time-consuming research is required when two identical names refer or seem to refer to different persons. It should be made clear in the database as well as in the authority files that these two persons are not identical although they have the same name and this happens more than you would think. A rough estimate only from Manuscripta Medievalia arrived at about 200,000 names for 100,000 to 110,000 different men and women. It would take a very clever and erudite librarian two years work and 90,000 euro to check all these names and to normalize them wherever it appears necessary. After that, there are about 40,000 titles of works by medieval authors, authors to be checked and normalized. The situation is, of course, much better in the case of descriptions of manuscripts which have been written directly into the cataloguing software of Manuscripta Medievalia. The cataloguing is supported here by the available authority files. No normalization is required in these descriptions. I already referred, however, to the names of medieval scripts in modern catalogues as well as in paleographical papers and monographs. My colleagues counted about 250 names of medieval scripts in Manuscripta Medievalia. These 250 names may refer to 250 different scripts, but it is of course much more likely that the number of scripts to be distinguished from each other is far lower. In spite of all sorts of obstacles, we are seriously trying to promote the interoperability of Manuscripta Medievalia with other databases containing descriptions of medieval manuscripts. The rather small but rapidly growing number of accurate descriptions of manuscripts in public collections in Switzerland, now available in the wonderful database called eCodices, can, of course, be searched through the search mask of eCodices itself, but also with very good results through Manuscripta Medievalia. In the course of next year, the relatively short descriptions of Odysseus 1 to 15,000 of the Austrian National Library, available in the local database named Tabulae, will be accessible through Manuscripta Medievalia as well. Interoperability requires open standards. These open standards are not, not yet available for the kinds of databases we are talking about. To promote interoperability, I see three different ways. The first way is the normalization of all sorts of names, as mentioned before, in each database containing descriptions of medieval manuscripts. This requires much time and considerable intellectual efforts and achievements. The second way lies in the further development of authority files in the national libraries of all the countries involved, containing as much as possible variant forms of names and entities. This development is certainly ongoing, it is taking place, but it will take several or even many years before the interoperability of these authority files will be reached. The third way is, in my view, complementary to the first, the, the first two ways. All descriptions of manuscripts and databases should be made available through a full text search. This seems easier than it is. The OCR treatment of printed catalogues of medieval manuscripts proves to be very difficult due to the major numbers of printed scripts and languages in these printed catalogues, especially in those catalogues printed before the Second World War. A simultaneous full text search in several databases at the same time is possible, 
provided that these databases are connected in the right way to achieve this goal. This kind of search is, however, attractive, but requires much patience on the side of the user, of the researcher. The number of useless hits you get is necessarily high. Let me come to a conclusion. Printed catalogues of medieval manuscripts are heterogeneous. Two very good catalogues may differ in many respects. Printed catalogues from different countries reflect not only the various ambitions and competences of the catalogers, the catalographers, but the national traditions in historical research as well. The same observation is valid for modern databases containing descriptions of medieval manuscripts. For that reason, and for the reasons I tried to enumerate in this paper, it is difficult, very difficult, to make databases interoperable. This requires much work and, consequently, much funding. This is the pessimist view. The optimist view refers to progress in information sciences. What is common practice today in digital humanities was either very difficult or expensive five years ago. What seems like an impossible endeavor today may prove to be manageable in the years to come. And by the way, I have great respect for printed catalogues of medieval manuscripts. I made a few myself. In the best case, these printed catalogues are, like Bandini's catalogue from the 18th century, monuments of learning and such monuments can still be erected. But the demand for this kind of books has diminished dramatically in the last years. Ten years ago, the library for which I work could sell at least 200 copies of our printed manuscript catalogues. Nowadays, we sell only 30 or 40. The market, that is, our colleagues, our libraries, at our research institutes, no longer want printed catalogues of manuscripts, but electronic catalogues. We should be aware of this. Thank you very much.
these are needs, scientific needs for our community and uh, uh, we should, we, we have to begin uh, uh, somewhere. Uh, it's not possible to do, as you say, uh, it is not possible to do that at all. But we have to, to realize something. And in Miram there are, I think, 8,000 anonymous works. If you had uh, with others and so on, become and so on. This is a practical way, uh, this integration in Anfield site uh, of databases is also a, a practical way to, to add, to accumulate uh, information which, which remain very fragmented and so on. So I, I, may I profit to say that if Lino Leonardo, if the Lino is agrees because he is responsible for the workshop, that all these talks, yours, yours and the coming, can be put in the website of Medioevo Europeo in the so that they will be accessible to all partners of the Europeo and, of course, uh, online. Uh, so this is, will be very interesting because uh, all these papers contain very important uh, suggestions and so on. Please, the discussion is open. I'll stand up, I think, if I may. Um, thank you for a very useful uh, summary of the, of the issues. I couldn't agree more that uh, authority files are necessary. I don't need them. I don't think. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, you, you didn't, well, uh, a lot of work has been going on for many years uh, on exactly these questions. And um, you didn't mention any of the work I've been involved in, uh, so I feel that I probably should. Uh, we started uh, with a meeting at Studley Priory, which is near Oxford in the United Kingdom, in 1997. A group of very large group, about 40 people, manuscript scholars and librarians from all over Europe and North America, in order to discuss this very issue. And one of the immediate results of that was the master project. Uh, 1999-2002, in which my friend Zdenia was also involved, uh, which was to define a machine-readable standard based on all the national standards uh, that we could think of. We had members from all catalogue traditions, and it was that, as you said, about 80% manuscript catalogues can agree on 80%. Uh, it was that 20% that they couldn't agree on that uh, was the interesting part of that project, but we did come up with a standard, or a proposal for a standard. Uh, in tandem to the master project, there was a North, North American project, uh, which turned into digital scriptorium and various other projects. I was subsequently appointed the head of a text and coding initiative working group to bring these two standards together into a single standard which we did, and this was taken over by the Text and Coding Initiative in TIP 5, which was released in 2007. At the same time as this work was going on, we were acutely aware of the importance of authority files, and there was another working group, of which I was also the head, uh, set up in order to work on what we call personography, which was a rather humorous Term, I suppose, at the time. Uh, essentially, prosopography. How do you encode data about people? And so, in answer, um, the, you, you, you don't need to normalize names. You need to point from the name to a single instance where you say, this is the person I'm talking about. Because as soon as you normalize the name, you say that's this person's real name. What is Bernardo Clairvaux's real name? Right? This morning at breakfast, you mentioned the city Breslau. What's the real name of the city? Right, Breslau is a useful name. A Pole would tell you that it's a Breslau, so it's, you know, and, and would get very angry. <laughs> 
So I want, I want my Poland to be the point here and my German to be the point to the same place. And we've done this, we have mechanisms for doing this in XML um, for persons, places, and institutions. Um, a huge problem, obviously, the vocabularies and the vocabularies, but that is just something that is going to have to come slowly. We have um, book, book binders, um, or rather people interested in bindings, very special type of people, I find, <laughs> book binding enthusiasts, and they can argue for years on what something should be called or whether it's the same as something else. But they're doing it, and they're coming up with a standard. So all we can do, I think, is encourage groups who feel strongly about things like this. I agree, probably, we will never get paleographers to agree, uh, but they are a really special group of people, as, as you know. So anyway, my only point is that a lot of the things that you point out as being um, requirements for the kind of interoperability that we're talking about, the mechanisms are in place. Right? So the, 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 the thing that we need to do is to encourage people to use these mechanisms rather than saying, oh, we have so many different standards, we should uh, work on how to uh, combine them. Um, the Text and Coding Initiative has spent 10 years um, coming up with these mechanisms which can be used. They can also be used, one of the things that we're working on, especially in Copenhagen at the moment, is um, how to describe manuscripts without using any words, right? So there, there are, in, in the perfect manuscript description, there, are, there is no text. The text can be generated in any language you like on the basis of the markup, the XML, once you have these standard um, vocabularies. But the mechanism is there. We can make a completely wordless manuscript description, mm -hmm. which you can view in Italian, in Dutch, in Arabic, uh, whatever. And I think that's, that's the future, is the, uh, is the uh, textless, textless data. Yeah. Right? Okay, so but, but I'll, I'll, then I'll react to the last one. The question is, from, um, from the database point of view, or from the point of view of the desirability of interoperability, this is true. But in my experience, those scholars who do the catalog doing are most reluctant to work with this kind of systems because um, they do not want to be restricted in the, in the vocabulary. They do agree to name Bernard von Clairvaux always in the same way. But for scripts and for elements of bookbinding and for many other aspects, they are very reluctant to use a standard vocabulary, even when it is available, because they feel uh, limited in their intellectual um, endeavor, which of course you can, actually, you, can, you can exaggerate and it's not in the same way with all catalographers, but catalographers who do in-depth cataloging um, re, um, consider themselves as researchers, scholars. Need, the other way is in libraries, formal cataloging, no making, there are very good rules, complicated rules for formal cataloging of titles of printed books or a formal cataloging of autograph letters, or of whatever, for, for maps. Um, but that is another question, you know, for, for um, scientific cataloging of medieval manuscripts, or even modern manuscripts, that is an intellectual work, or the work of an intellectual. <laughs>